After the capture of Boston, General George Washington left no time to waste. He guessed correctly that the British would now try to capture New York City. He immediately marched his troops there and began fortifying the city and the surrounding region. So, why New York? Boston was a major port along the Atlantic coast, but it wasn't the largest. By the mid-1770s, New York was the center for American culture and commerce. New York was a vital link between the New England and Southern colonies. Lines of communication, supply, and troops all passed through New York. Whoever controlled this city and the Hudson River and Hudson River Valley effectively controlled the northern part of the new nation. Right now, this was the American rebels. Washington and the British general, Sir William Howe, knew this and that New York was the linchpin. Whoever controlled New York City controlled northern commerce and logistics and whoever controlled the Hudson Valley, controlled troop transport. In January of 1776, General Washington dispatched General Charles Lee to the city to begin building its defenses. Lee built a series of forts surrounding the city, the most important of which was named Fort Washington and was placed at the northern end of Manhattan Island. The other two forts, Fort Constitution, later renamed to Fort Lee, was meant to guard the Hudson River from the New Jersey side, and then Fort Independence was built in Westchester to both guard the area and support Fort Washington. These forts were meant to secure the approaches to the city from the Hudson River and the bay. Essentially, they were meant to nullify any British advantage in naval power and force their troops onto land. There, the defenses of the surrounding areas would pin them down and stop any advance. This is similar to the Bunker Hill defense, just on a larger scale. During the next few months, Washington began hearing words of British ships and soldiers massing north in Nova Scotia and had their sights on New York City. Washington called for reinforcements, primarily from Massachusetts, and while he got a few, for the most part, he was left out to dry. I should pause for a moment and state something that should be fairly obvious at this point. American intelligence was very bad. During the initial weeks of the war, the intelligence wasn't really that bad. The Americans were able to notify their forces of the British movements towards Lexington and Concord, and they were able to figure out that the British would attack Bunker Hill. These were important victories, but they all happened at the last minute. Both moves of the British Army were only able to have been correctly identified as British actions as soon as they were about to happen, such as at Bunker Hill, or as they were already marching towards Lexington and Concord. During the Quebec campaign, major errors led to thousands of soldiers' deaths. American intelligence incorrectly predicted that they would receive major support from the French Canadians. This support did not materialize in major numbers. They also incorrectly thought that a small American force could overwhelm a small British garrison. This, of course, did not happen. American chances of victory died along with their soldiers in the blistering snowstorm in Quebec City last Christmas. It was here in New York that American intelligence would have their largest blunder. Washington knew that the British had a massive force to attack New York City. He thought he knew that it was about 130 ships in number. He did not know where in New York they would attack or with how many soldiers they would attack with. He most importantly, though, had no idea when the British would attack. He just knew that they would arrive at some point. He had to guess at which places to guard and fortify, and so he chose to fortify the harbor and rivers due to the British Navy. This is only a bad decision in hindsight. At the time, I feel like Washington made the right choice with the knowledge he had. He also knew that he had bad intel. He wrote to Congress during the time the following quote, nor have we any further intelligence on their designs. There is one final point I need to make. The British knew of the American fortifications, where their defenses were and which roads were and were not guarded. In summary, American intelligence was abysmal during the New York campaign and left Washington high and dry. Consequences of this 
would be absolutely catastrophic. When the British arrived, they did so in force. American soldiers recounted looking out over the horizon in the morning and seeing the massive British armada impose over the harbor of New York City. Soon after that, British troops began landing on Staten Island. This would be their base to attack the city. The force was led by Admiral Richard Howe and General William Howe. Now, it is important to mention that the Howe brothers both saw this conflict as something that could be resolved peacefully. They saw the American colonists as fellow countrymen. They gave out a pamphlet that stated that any colonist who betrayed the enemy force would receive money and land when the war was over. This did not work. They then met with some members of the Continental Congress, including Ben Franklin, to try and find a peace settlement. This did not work. A major factor in defeating any peace attempts was the Declaration of Independence, which had just been signed and sent out. As the British were landing troops and preparing for an attack, people in New York read out the document to the American soldiers. The war had just reached the point of no return. With signatures on that piece of paper, peace would only occur once the armies of either side were defeated. The American soldiers had something to fight for before, but now it was concrete. This war was for their liberty, their wealth, and for the futures of their families. Given this context, I do not think it's that crazy that peace is not achieved here. However, I want you all to remember how the Howe brothers saw that the battle was between compatriots rather than a revolution. This different lens would have implications later on in this campaign. With the collapse of peace talks, the time for battle had begun. On the morning of August 22nd, 4,000 British regulars landed unopposed on Long Island. In the weeks prior, the Americans had fortified the island heavily. There were troops here on the beaches, but they merely retreated and burned some supplies. By the noon of that day, 15,000 British soldiers and 40 artillery pieces had arrived. All of this was unopposed. Washington was told by his intelligence that about only 9,000 had landed there. He felt like it was a feint and only sent 1,500 reinforcements to the American positions. The following day, 5,000 Hessian troops arrived to reinforce the British. There were now 6,000 American soldiers facing 20,000 British soldiers. The Americans held strong positions on Brooklyn Heights overlooking this area and prepared for the incoming British attack. Remember when I said American intelligence was abysmal? This is their first and absolutely horrific mistake. The night before the attack was to commence, a loyalist told the British about a route behind American lines that was only sparsely defended. It was called Jamaica Pass, and if the British attacked there, they could outflank the American defenses. The morning of the attack, a force of 10,000 British soldiers attacked the Americans straight on. The fighting was rough and casualties were sustained on both sides. Importantly, the American defenses were formidable and held against the waves of British attacks. As this went on, though, General Charles Cornwallis led his men through Jamaica Pass and surprised the Americans. There were only five militiamen patrolling the area when Cornwallis arrived, and they were easily overwhelmed, and the American forces on Long Island were quickly surrounded. This is the first moment that the Howe brothers' timidness had an impact. They ordered the British troops not to force an assault on the American positions. Instead, they would eventually attack and fight the rear guard. The Americans were able to evacuate most of their forces back towards New York City. Later on, when they were asked why they did not attack, William Howe said that it was because of the fear of heavy casualties like at Bunker Hill. Some people bought the argument, some people didn't. I actually do believe how here, although I definitely think some of his personal beliefs got in the way, uh, but I don't think that was the whole reason for him not attack. 
realizing what had just occurred. Washington began moving troops to fortify Brooklyn Heights and staffing the forts that dotted the city's upper reaches. It was now that the sheer amount of British troops became apparent. Washington was under the impression that he was facing about the same amount of British troops that he commanded in his army. It was only now that he realized that the British forces were more than his. Washington took the before-mentioned route, evacuating his forces north to fortify the forts, sent another contingent to garrison the city. His biggest fear was that he would be outflanked via the sea, which was actually very warranted. In September, Howe landed troops in Manhattan as a way of outflanking Washington and trapping him in New York City. In turn, Washington quickly withdrew his army to the north to Harlem Heights and to all of his fortifications. There was a very good chance that had Howe pinned Washington in New York City, the war would have ended then and there. Howe pursued Washington to Harlem Heights. He caught up to him on September 16th and prepared for an attack. On the morning of the 16th, Washington sent up a small group of soldiers to reconnoiter the British lines. The party encountered some British pickets in the skirmish. Though the loss was small, the commander of the small recon force, Thomas Knowlton, realized he was getting outflanked and ordered a retreat. Howe then ordered his army to follow them, believing that the larger American force was also retreating. Instead, he found Washington's army very well intact and very much not running. The forces engaged and the fighting stagnated until a small American cavalry force flanked the British and forced them to retreat. While only a small skirmish, the Battle of Harlem Heights became the first time the American forces had beaten back the British during this campaign. Washington waited there on the high ground for a bit. He knew that these were important places to potentially hold, but at the same time his army had suffered major casualties over the course of the campaign. He had some of his troops retreat north into the hills and asked Israel Putnam to scout ahead to figure out where the British army had camped. Shortly, Putnam returned, informing Washington that not only were the British nearby, but their camps also threatened the army's retreat and supply lines. Putnam pointed out that the towns of White Plains seemed to be the pathway forward. Washington rushed men into the town and prepared a hasty defense on a hill overlooking the area. The British army encountered him and Howe sent a force of British regulars and Hessian mercenaries up the hill to take it. The fighting was brief and brutal. The American militia collapsed under the intense attack and discipline by the British soldiers. Seeing the right side of his army fade away, Washington ordered a retreat and had the Delaware regiment swing over from his left to provide covering fire till they could all be brought out in good order. Over the next few days, Washington and Howe fortified the surrounding hills. Howe decided that he would attack Washington the next day to finish off his army, but that proved to be too late. Washington had already pulled his men back towards Fort Washington and across the Hudson River. When everything was settled on November the 16th, Washington ordered the evacuation of Fort Washington. This was the final Patriot Fort on the New York side of the Hudson River. The reason for ordering this retreat was because of British forces outflanking every single position and nearly surrounding the fort. The fort was thought to be impossible to take given its advantageous position overlooking the entire battlefield. It was well provisioned, filled with cannons, and had 3,000 men. Washington was convinced by his confidant Nathaniel Green and the garrison commander Robert McGaw to let them hold out. This so impregnable fortress lasted only about a half a day. After it was surrounded on all sides by Hessian soldiers and the Royal Navy, in just 12 hours, the British forced the surrender of 3,000 of Washington's soldiers. The Americans were absolutely stunned, and when the British forces swung north quickly and landed near Fort Lee on the 20th, they ordered a hasty retreat without firing a shot. Every single fort that had been constructed by General Lee early on in the campaign were now held in British hands without hardly a single casualty. It was getting cold in the United States. Fearing that his army would be caught out in the open during the winter and that the British would be pushing towards the American capital of Philadelphia, Washington marched his men all the way through New Jersey and into Pennsylvania. 
all the while being pursued by the British Army and Hessian mercenaries. Morale was extremely low during this time. Cold weather, lack of food, the impending attack on the capital, and the fact that the Americans were thoroughly kicked out of New York City all played a part in this. The Patriots stopped their retreat just across the Delaware River. Here is where Washington would regroup and prepare for the spring. On the opposite side, British General Charles Cornwallis ordered his forces to stop the pursuit and prepare for winter. His men established a series of forts from New Brunswick to Burlington. This winter would be used to resupply by both armies and a time to draw up new plans. The New York campaign had been an utter disaster for the Americans. After the decisive victory in Boston a year prior, this felt like a punch in the gut. Many in the government even asked if Washington was the right man to lead their army. Washington's own men even questioned him. Things weren't all amazing for the British, though. Remember how General Howe took a more lax approach to these battles because of his view that the Americans could be brought back into the fold? Those decisions would haunt him for the rest of the war and the rest of his career. Howe had multiple different occasions where he could have ended the entire conflict by capturing Washington and the large Patriot army. So, while Washington was beaten, he was still alive. Howe's incompetence had turned what could have been an overall strategic victory into just a tactical one, but albeit a very good tactical victory. Washington would live on to fight another day. Fight on he would, because while the British were resting and celebrating their victory, George Washington was scheming. Yeah.